Hi, and welcome to this channel. I'm Claire, and I love talking about Arbus Nama, women's histories, and the weird, wonderful, interesting ways these two subjects often interconnect. Sometimes I like talking about LGBTQI representation, sometimes I like talking about awesome swords, and sometimes I like to find ways of shoehorning in interesting, weird, unexpected subjects and relating them to Arbus Nama and queer representation somehow. So today, let's do exactly that. Let's talk about a unicorn sword. So this fabulous bad boy that we're going to talk about in particular resides in the collections of the Imperial Treasury in Vienna. And made around 1450, it's got lots of things going for it. Its hilt, that's the handle, is adorned with an uncut ruby, flanked by six pearls. It's got a tiny animal picture of the crucifixion of Christ on one side, and a tiny animal picture of the Virgin Mary on the other side. So, great bargain deal if you're a fan of swords and religious imagery on your sword. It's got gilded decorations on its handle and scabbard, but what that handle and scabbard are made of are really what make it unique. And that material is, you guessed it, a unicorn horn. Or at least a unicorn horn as it would have been perceived at the time. But why? Aside from the fact that, you know, it's, it's kind of fabulous and cool, uh, what's the actual reason behind wanting to own a unicorn sword? Well, maybe a clue comes from who actually originally owned that sword, and that would be Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy. So Charles the Bald, you know, vibing in the 15th century, was like, you know what, Duke is fine, it's okay, but King, King, now that's, that's what I'm talking about, King is a lot better, and yeah, objectively agree. So he decides, why not unify all these different Burgundian territories into one kingdom, that conveniently, I will rule. Problem is, this made the Austrian Empire very angry, made the French very angry, uh, not just because of territorial disputes, we're just uh, naturally angry people, and it also got the Swiss involved, and if you messed around with the Swiss in the 15th century, things were not going to go well for you. The Swiss Confederacy had a very powerful army, which definitely proves its worth in battles against Charles of Bold, in which they just mercilessly uh, defeated the Duke of Burgundy. So overall, Charles of Bold, definitely not successful in terms of becoming king, but he definitely had the ambitions of one, and wanted that to be known to the rest of the world. So what does that have to do with a unicorn sword? Well, it turns out, everything. Because this fabulous bad boy we're talking about maybe wasn't encrusted with the biggest jewels, or the most complex decorations, but what it was made of, this material of uh, the scabbard and the handle being made from this unicorn horn, was really where it derived all its symbolic power from because the unicorn horn, or the alicorn, was seen as a status of power that was fit for a king. And you may be thinking, Claire, you usually try and shoehorn a woman in there somehow. Turns out I actually did manage to find a warrior woman connection linked to Charles the Bold. In 1472, Charles the Bold has a good idea, <laughs> good idea, of attacking the town of Beauvais. Why is that a bad idea? Well, as soon as his soldiers the Burgundian soldiers start attacking the walls of the city, the citizens uh, inside decide, you know what, no, not today, no thank you. All of them start defending themselves against the soldiers, so all civilians, including the women. And one of them, Joan Linné, attacks a standard bearer with a heckin' axe. Or, you know, a small axe. A hatchet. A travel-sized axe, basically. She was celebrated throughout the town of Beauvais for her bravery, and, to this day, is known as Joan the Hatchet. But let's have a look at our unicorn sword, and let's have a look at why. You know, why was it a symbol of power uh, fit for a king or a queen? And for that we need a crash course in unicorn lore. Before becoming an absolute icon in terms of fantasy fiction, in terms of Lisa Frank notebooks, and even in terms of video games, the unicorn was a major legendary figure, and descriptions of it emerged as early as antiquity, and it was always described as this animal with a long spiralled horn on its forehead. Which is very interesting in itself, because animal uh, <laughs> is, is pretty vague. That's because uh, those descriptions of the unicorn would vary wildly, um, so much so that when you look at descriptions today, with our knowledge of animals, you kind of realise that types of animals that were being referred to were probably, for example, a horned bull or a rhinoceros. So what emerged from all of that is the current mainstream idea of what a unicorn is. A dazzling white horse with a long spiralled horn on its forehead. 
and most importantly, a symbol of power and purity as early as the medieval period who cannot be tamed and cannot be contained by anything or anyone. Almost. And the exception is virgin girls. Weird selection criteria, but okay. So what does this mean in practice? It means that if you have an untamed unicorn that you're trying to capture or just get close enough to, only a virgin girl would be able to make the unicorn chill long enough for any of that to happen, for some reason. So this was made into an elaborate Christian allegory. It was also made into an allegory for courtly love. So these are medieval depictions of love that are usually centered around chivalry and nobility. It also becomes a symbol for faithful marriage, honestly, great bargain deal on all these different uh, meanings for one image of a unicorn chilling with a virgin girl. Uh, well done. So it's been established that the unicorn is this mystical creature, right? But the biggest deal with the unicorn is quite literally its horn, its anicorn. That is really the source of its magical, mystical powers. And what does that horn do? Well, it was rumoured to be a source of healing and anti-poison. From the 14th century onwards, authors were obsessed with the idea that if you had a contaminated body of water, a unicorn could just come along, just, just, you know, just rock up to, to the contaminated body of water, dip, why am I, I don't have a horn, dip their horn into said body of water and suddenly the water would be purified and it would be fit for, for drinking by, by anyone, uh, cute woodland creatures, humans, other mythical creatures, you name it. Was there a huge issue with just poisoned water in um, 14th century Europe? Do they mean more kind of contaminated, as in stagnant, bodies of water? Was this the first kind of proper water filtration system? Did the unicorn add stuff to the water, like flavouring, bubbles, fluorides, to make everybody's teeth brighter? We don't know. These are the types of questions that I don't think any 14th century author has gone into great detail about, although I could be wrong. But either way, people really just took that idea and, and ran with it, sprinted with it. And soon the widespread belief was that if you, for example, drank from a cup that was made from the horn of a unicorn, if you dipped a unicorn horn into your drink, or if you chopped up powdered bits of unicorn horn into your food, you would be protected from any poison that had been previously contained in that food or drink, and you would also be protected from a range of diseases. Because yeah, surprisingly, back then, in a time period full of rampant disease and low life expectancy, people thought that the most mystical, magical, wonderful thing that could happen would be having one simple procedure or device that could protect you and your loved ones from diseases. Imagine medieval people's reactions uh, if they knew that centuries later there would be simple procedures put in place so that you could easily protect yourself from said diseases and the ones around you. And imagine their reaction when they find out that some people don't believe in that sort of thing and don't believe in science because of conspiracies. And you know, believe that if they get injected with a vaccine, they'll get 5G, 5G service or something. I'm not really sure what the, what 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 the what the theory is. Um, either way, please get vaccinated. <laughs> Back to the fabulous, glamorous, but also very much unvaccinated medieval period. So, in short, the alicorn was a hit. Um, everybody wanted their hands on, on an alicorn. So a certain amount of them were circulating in Europe in medieval and renaissance periods, and it was definitely that case of, I think, high demand and low supply, which obviously contributed to uh, making them rare and valuable as items that you could have as part of your collection. If you had a unicorn horn, you were set, and it was also very popular in terms of gifting. Oh, you got gold, you got jewels, well, I've got a three meter unicorn horns, so beat that. But you know, it was also great in other different ways, not just in its raw form, or as a cup, or chopped up in powder and mixed into your food. It was also great as a scepter for the ruler of the Austrian Empire, and it was also good as a throne for the King of Denmark. Great piece of interior design. And it was great as a sword. Now it's unclear to me how early on people started questioning the fact that all these horns turning up without ever being attached to actual remains or skeletons of unicorns 
were not really unicorn horns. Um, I don't know how kind of solid the belief was, I don't know how solid the unicorn scam was. What I do know is that back in the 17th century, a guy called Uli Worm it was like, no, stop. Everyone, or have you been drinking in your uh, unicorn horn cups? This is not a unicorn horn. This is the horn of the narwhal, the majestic narwhal, uh, which we could consider as an underwater unicorn um, in some sense. But the revelation does make the unicorn any less powerful in terms of its cultural impact. Although today you'd probably associate it a little less with hanging out with virgins and anti-poison, and more so with sparkles, rainbows and pastel colours, as well as, in some ways, queerness. It's often due to the fact that it came to be commonly associated with rainbows, and by extension, the rainbow flag, created in 1978 by Gilbert Baker. But it seems to really take off in 2016 in terms of just aggressively rainbow unicorn branded prides and LGBTQI merchandise, but also in terms of wider mainstream fashion uh, pieces of design, cosmetics with lots of um, lots of sparkles and glitter, and even unicorn inspired food with the beautiful monstrosity that is the unicorn frappuccino. I don't know what this tasted like, I don't know how it held up in terms of the experience, but if you have tasted the unicorn frappuccino, let, let me know, let me know in the comments. But you know, why, exploring a bit more, why was there this whole obsession with the unicorn at that time. Well, 2016, I can tell you, was a year where I can understand that some people might want to take refuge in a kind of pastel coloured, childhood themed um, kind of world. And I think there is some of that to some extent from what I've read. And I think that by some extension, the unicorn being associated with the LGBTQI community is also kind of linked to that. Um, lots of people who are part of the LGBTQI community, especially those who have come out uh, a lot later, uh, more into adulthood, definitely do uh, share the experience of having a bit of a second adolescence going on, and kind of revisiting stuff from uh, either their childhood or their teenage years in different ways that they hadn't been able to um, experience as their true selves at the time. Look at media like She-Ra, um, even more recently, which has this whole array of, you know, first unapologetically queer and trans characters, but also these vibrant colours, these sparkles, rainbows, and it turns out uh, a unicorn with wings, a rainbow wings, I might add, called Swiftwind. Uh, we love Swiftwind, an icon, um, a steed for an iconic lesbian character with a sword as well. And the origins of the unicorn as a toy are actually not that old, um, relatively recent in terms of historical terms at least. It has its roots in the 19th century and where the first um, fantasy depictions of them in fantasy fiction started to appear as well. The very first appearance was actually in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. Also, shout out to Jewel the Unicorn in the Chronicles of Narnia. This very cool unicorn who wore a fabulous gold chain around his neck uh, and also used his horn as a weapon in battle. So we're really going full circle here. But earlier on, even before this reclaiming by the LGBTQI community, the unicorn had always been a bit of a gender transgressor. It's a symbol of masculinity, sort of virility and power, but it's also a companion to ladies uh, who becomes more of this soft, delicate, tender creature in their presence. It's described in many ways and it kind of shifts in terms of gendered attitudes and appearances. It's powerful but it's delicate, it's fierce but it's pure, and it kind of messes with our assumptions overall. Like in the 1991 book The Last Unicorn, this last unicorn takes on a human appearance uh, and the human appearance of a girl, but I think there's different ways of interpreting this as just one of the forms that the unicorn could have taken on. Basically, the unicorn is too cool for your gender binaries. But I think beyond this interpretation alone, there's maybe a more powerful underlying metaphor for LGBTQI community and identity in there. Because, spoiler alert, the last unicorn ultimately realises they're not, as they believed for a long time, the last of their kind. And they come across a whole community of other unicorns. I'm not really sure what you call a, a group. Of, of unicorns, like a, a murder of prose, um, maybe a dream of unicorns. But essentially the, the whole thing is that they realise that they're not alone 
and that they can be and live in this community uh, with people who, with other unicorns that share their experiences and, and share their troubles and, and share their feelings. And I think that's really one of the most beautiful metaphors for what it means when you are a person who identifies on the LGBTQI spectrum and feel as though, especially when you're growing up with not much link to queer media or queer community, feel as though nobody can understand your experiences and that you're alone, this is all a phase, that you're kidding yourself, etc. And when you kind of finally find that community, you realise that you have people that, that you have people who can understand your experiences, understand what it meant to feel all alone, to feel excluded, to feel different. And yeah, no, I'm kind of like that's that's pretty that's pretty beautiful. It makes me feel quite emotional, to be honest. It's also that idea of um, of a mystical creature that many people um, say you know is, is very very elusive. And I think this kind of legendary mystical aspect is also what sticks with people who've always been told that their identities do not exist. It's all a fad. It's all a fashion. Um, it's that way of reclaiming. Well, actually. I am here. I am a unicorn, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going away. And I also have a sharp horn, so watch out. <laughs> now it's worth saying this is one perspective. The unicorn has also been associated with a lot less positive things in terms of the LGBTQI community. And it's also worth noting that the image of the unicorn is used by many people within the LGBTQI community as a way of joking about, but also criticise the ways in which their identities are made invisible. Unicorn, not always a positive LGBTQI symbol, or sometimes for many people, not even an LGBTQI symbol at all, or maybe one that has been imposed externally by the mainstream, which is interesting. In fact, it's sometimes seen by some as a byproduct of rainbow capitalism and that kind of idea of a fluffy, happy, sparkly, sugar coated version of queerness that uh, completely kind of overlooks this idea of more kind of anger and fangs uh, and, and activism uh, when it comes to fighting for the LGBTQI community's rights. But I think that's where it gets interesting because to some there is something powerful about actually taking that symbol of, of, of you know, that pastel, sparkly, rainbow coloured symbol and also reclaiming it as a way of expressing your anger, your queer politics and your activism. For many people it's a way of being able to reclaim their femininity in new ways and yeah reclaim that fabulousness um, and be able to kind of express that in ways that they haven't been able to before and in many people it's kind of weaponizing that cuteness and that fluffiness into something that can be a symbol of anger and power, kind of going back to the original medieval unicorn to be honest. But really just like the nature of you know how you feel and how you identify cannot be relegated to a single term or a single label, just in the same way the unicorn cannot be relegated to a single thing, a single definition. That is definitely what you make of it, how you imagine and reinterpret it, and how you make a sword out of it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video please subscribe, like and comment what you think about unicorns. I'd, I'd quite like to know, uh, in addition to the whole whether you've ever tasted the frappuccino because I'd also like to know. You can follow me on my social media at Carmen Claire for more rambling on swords and sword ladies. You can listen to my podcast Bustles and Broadswords all about women um, with swords throughout history, as well as women with hatchets throughout history, and I'll definitely be covering Joan Lanier in the future. And you can also read my webcomic, Girls' School of Knighthood, which is all about women with swords in a fantasy setting. No unicorns, but hey, lots of swords and lots of LGBTQI content. Stay safe, sword lovers, and see you in another video.